Thank you very much, and welcome to our talk, Graph Features in Spark 3.0. Uh, my name is Mats, and uh, I, come, I work for Neo4j, and with me today is my colleague Max. And uh, we'd like to talk to you a little bit about our projects leading up to uh, this contribution that we're trying to uh, get into Spark 3.0, which revolves around graphs. And graphs is something that we at Neo4j live and breathe, uh, so it's very central to our thinking. And I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of perspective on why is that and why is graph such a good thing. So graphs are everywhere. It's kind of our slogan. I think I have it on my back on my t-shirt. Um, here we have three uh, famous things. Well, the one in the middle may be less famous. It's more of a visionary thing. It's an astronaut on Mars. So that comes from a story where uh, some scientists at NASA have been using Neo4j and graph analytics, and they uh, quoted that uh, due to the prowess of the graph model and uh, the product, they were able to get an astronaut on Mars two years earlier than predicted. Still hasn't happened though, but we'll see. That's what they said. On the left side, it's a visualization of the internet. It's a very famous graph, of course. Uh, which a very famous internet search company uh, used as a fact to dominate what's now what we now know uh, of the internet using a graph algorithm known as PageRank to take over the search space and grow into a, one of the largest corporations on earth. And on the right hand side here we have a picture from the Panama Papers leak. So you may have rec may recall when this hit the world, it was one of the largest leak of financial transactions ever made. Super difficult for the journalists at the ICIJ, the, Invest the International Consortium for Investigative Journalism, who, who received this data leak. How can they process this massive amount of documents and data? And uh, using NIFJ and graphs, they were actually able to to do so effectively and find out many consequential uh, new stories out of this data leak. Graphs are also growing. Graph is not is, is a, we believe, a universal data model that is applicable to many, many software industries. And uh, this is a chart taken from the dbengines.com ranking chart. It mostly focuses on databases and processing engines relating to databases, and they have different categories. The green one that's on the top here, that's the graph category. It's growing very fast. You also have some of the very uh, established models here, of course. They don't grow as fast, even though they are very, very big, of course, the SQL models and the key value stores, etc. But this is sort of another indicator that for many years, graphs has, have been growing, and we're still growing. And even at this conference, the Spark AI Summit 2019 in Europe, we looked at the program, and even though some of these talks are from our colleagues at Neo4j, definitely that's not uh, all of them. There are, what is it, seven different talks with graph in their title. This is only also, I think, a good indication of why, how graphs are becoming increasingly mainstream and increasingly popular and, and as a, in a very big and uh, widespread uh, system such as Apache Spark. Maybe graphs should also be part of the system as a native, uh, native component. So what are graphs? Well, the property graph data model is something that we talk about when we talk about graphs in general. Uh, you may have uh, studied graph theory in, in a computer science course on in a university. You typically talk about elementary graphs. They're kind of simple. You have nodes relating to other nodes through edges, or as we call them, relationships. Uh, but the property graph data model is an extension of that where you also have uh, labels and property key value pairs on the uh, elements, the nodes and relationships of the graph. 
uh, and Max will uh, will will get to more about the proper graph data model. Here we see that uh, well some some uh, claims that it's not just us doing proper graph data model or proper graphs anymore. Microsoft has products. Amazon has products. Oracle producing things in the property graph space. And uh, we're also having a uh, ISO standard project called uh, under the name of GQL, which is aiming at developing a uh, language for property graph querying, similar to SQL. So GQL and SQL. You'll hear much more about that if you're interested in the graph space as we proceed. We'll be talking not so much about GQL today. We'll instead talk about Cypher, which is something that exists today. It has been developed by Neo4j, but we're going to show you how we can run Cypher also in Apache Spark and how that is actually something that is very useful. Why Apache Spark? Well, it's a very big system. It's a general purpose processing platform with many integration capabilities into many different systems. You all know that. I don't need to convince you why Apache Spark is a good thing, probably. Something that Apache Spark doesn't have is graphs. But that's what we're talking about here today, adding that. So graphs are coming to Spark. In earlier this year, we had a Spark project improvement proposal that we wrote together with Shang Rimeng. And uh, we got that passed, the Apache Spark voting process. And we've been working to implement this into Spark 3.0, which is about to be pre-released, preview released, I think. That was the, some of the latest news. And uh, the goal is to bring property graphs and the Cypher property graph query language, and those capabilities, into Spark itself. Similar to how Spark SQL already exists there, so that you can have SQL querying for your tabular work cases. You can have Cypher querying for your graph work cases or use cases. And uh, you can interoperate between these languages and flow dynamically between them, which is uh, very convenient, we think. Status right now, we're still working progress. It's not completed. Uh, the implementation of this has been uh, a project we've been uh, working on for several years. It was uh, initially named Cypher for Apache Spark, short caps, uh, which we have presented also at previous Spark summits. We now call this Morpheus, but uh, this is because the module we're merging into Spark is going to be probably called Spark Cypher, just like Spark SQL, Spark Cypher. That's the point. And uh, then I'd like to show you a little bit of code here. Let's see if I can do this with holding my microphone. Oh, you can hold it. That's neat. Oh, you have to hold it closer. You have to roll really close. I don't think you, you have to be top down or something. Uh, let me see. Can you press control arrow? <laughs> there we go. And we want the simple demo. So just going to run some code here from my inver <coughs> development environment so we can see what happens here. Well, first some very standard stuff. You set up your Spark session, and you create a few data frames. In this very simple example, we just have uh, some, uh, some data frame with uh, three columns, integers, strings, Boolean. And there's apparently there's an Alice and a Bob. And we call this name and column person. This is our sort of label syntax. This means what type of node is this. And these are both person type, so they get a true value in this column. All of this is just creating some data frames. Then interesting stuff happens down here, where we create a property graph. So we take these data frames, and uh, using the uh, a naming-based convention. We know that columns that start with a colon represent labels, so that those are the types of the elements, similar for relationship type here, whereas other columns are interpreted as properties of these entities. So we can arrive at a graph, and once we have a graph, which is a property graph class, we can call 
dot cipher on it, and you give it a cipher query. In this case, we'll talk more about the exact style of a cipher query and how those work. But uh, a key point of a cipher query is this match clause, which takes a pattern in ASCII art format. So if you've seen a graph on a whiteboard or in a uh, computer science course, you typically see people writing circles, connecting with arrows to other circles. That's sort of the, uh, the heritage that we try to keep with the cipher syntax here. So these parentheses encapsulate something that looks sort of like a circle. Uh, in this case, it's a variable here. Uh, it uh, is a person type, so we look for persons who know other persons, and then we return them. And if I can get the, uh, we can just run this. Uh, it takes a little while to get the start thing, Spark thing started up. The result of the Cypher query is going to be a table. Then we just grab the data frame out of that and uh, show it, just like you do do a normal data frame. So that is sort of the workflow. You set up your data frames, you create a graph, and you can run Cypher queries. And in this case, the result looks something like this. So Alice is a person who knows some other person. And let's see if we can go back. Right. So the property graph. The property graph. Why is it interesting? Yeah, I mentioned I mentioned the whiteboarding aspect. Like typically you will have a business problem of some sort where you have different components. Maybe you have transactions between your customers who purchase products or uh, they go through some sort of process where there are multiple entities that they have to pass by, so you draw sort of an entity relationship diagram like this. And then you have to go on and create your SQL tables to, uh, to back this up. But in that process, you typically have to jump through some hoops to make sure that this model is retained even on the physical level, whereas the physical level looks very different. With graph, you sort of change that. So the whiteboard model is the physical model. What you write on this whiteboard is directly represented in the graph. This is some uh, UI output from uh, the Neo4j browser, which is sort of a workbench in where you can work with Neo4j, writing Cypher queries, getting results back, and you can also inspect them in uh, sort of an interactive UI style. Um, so here, for example, there are some, uh, there's a company and there are CEOs and sales going on and all of the nodes and relationships that you've defined in your business model are directly represented by the physical model. So there's no uh, extra layer of indirection that you have to consider. So in order to be thorough and go through the property graph model, what does it contain? Like, like I mentioned, you have nodes and relationships. The nodes are the sort of elementary data points. Th that's where you typically store most of your data. You have different types of nodes. But what's most interesting, and th this is like rows in a SQL table, not super interesting in and of themselves. But when you, and you can add key value pairs, these are like the columns of a SQL table. But when you go to the relationship, that's why when it starts to become interesting. Because then you start relating different uh, data points between on, on like the lowest level to other data points. Almost like a foreign key, but it's in a native model, you can really make some nice uh, computations in a very performant way by looking at how di data points of different types relate to other data points of different types. And in multi-hop, you can see how a person relates to a business that relates to another business that maybe relates to something entirely different and see how those relationships actually uh, come to life and uh, you can make, uh, you can draw very interesting insights out of that. So uh, the, in the model, there are labels on nodes. Nodes can have multiple labels. There are also sort of labels on relationships. We call them relationship types. Relationships can only have a single type. And in fact, it must have a type. So there are no untyped relationships. Relationships also have their own identity. 
So you can have multiple relationships of the same type in the same direction between the same nodes, if you so wish. So compared to sort of the relational model, where we maybe have a user table, a business table, and then you have a user business join table to relate how your users uh, correspond to your businesses. In the graph, you would just have a user node and direct relationships to the businesses that are relevant for that user, similarly then for other users as well. So you remove one layer of indirection. And now I'm happy to hand the word over to Max, who will tell you a little bit about the model we've been using in order to uh, implement this graph system or graph processing capabilities in Spark, which doesn't have any native graph components in its core. Thank you. All right. So um, as Maps already said, the question is now, how do we actually represent the graph in a system like Spark? Um, and our um, main starting point actually was that we, we didn't want to invent something entirely new, uh, and we wanted to leverage the existing components in the Apache Spark. So what we decided is we will actually build our entire graph system on top of uh, Spark SQL and the, the relational abstraction that already existed in um, Apache Spark. So, and then there's the question, how do we actually represent a, a graph in a relational model? And probably some of you have already used um, GraphX, so the currently existing simple Spar uh, graph component that exists in Spark. And um, their graph is basically very simply represented. It usually consists out of two tables, one table for all the nodes, or, or it's, it's not actually not a table, it's a data set, if I remember correctly. It's a data set for all the nodes, and it's another data set for all the relationships. And this already lets you represent almost any graph that you want. Um, however, as Mats already pointed out, um, the property graph model allows you to have many different kinds of nodes. So you ha can have nodes for your persons, you can have nodes for the ca a company, you can have nodes for whatever concept you have in your data model. And those nodes, they usually they have different uh, properties, and also the data can come from different data sources. So in order to um, satisfy this uh, this model where we only have two tables, you have to basically combine all your data into a single data frame, um, which has two downsides, we think. Um, the first downside is you have to combine the data. So that's a very tedious process. Imagine you have like five or four different or even more different types of nodes in your graph, and you have to combine them into a single table. And then if they have different properties, um, you have to basically create a very wide table with uh, that is very sparsely populated because um, you have you have to have columns for every property in uh, every existing node, and then you have to like fill the blanks with nulls, and that that didn't seem very um, appealing. So what we actually invented was um, a model that we called uh, tables for labels, um, <laughs> and that basically means that you have a single table per um, existing node label combination or relationship type in your graph. So in the example graph that we had before, we had those uh, person nodes. So all the person nodes, they would be stored in a separate table. And then we had the company nodes or business nodes, um, and they would be stored in a separate table. And the same goes basically for relationships. So we had the nodes relationships, they would be stored in a table. And the um, works at, I think, relationship or reviewed relationships. Um, they would be stored in a separate table. And then the graph consists of this um, set of tables. Um, this allows us to basically infer uh, a very um, a further sh schema for the graph. So basically we, we uh, define a, a fixed schema for every node label combination and the same goes for relationships. So we have information about given a node that has um, a person label, for example, given that node we know what kind of properties has it, what uh, data type do those properties have, uh, and even how many of them exist in a graph, because we can simply count that relationship. Uh, th and that has also the um, positive effect that you can basically load your data from different sources. So let's say your person data comes from a relational database and all your purchase data comes from your data warehouse. Then you can just uh, load the data into different data frames. You don't have to combine them in a very clumsy way. You just uh, combine them when you load the graph, and we will do all the rest of the work internally for you. 
we, uh, for that matter, basically define a graph schema. So if ever you have worked with Neo4j or probably also some other graph databases, they are often schema free or schema optional. So you, they don't enforce a certain schema on your graph. So you can have two person nodes and one person node can have a certain set of uh, a certain set of properties and this another node labeled person can have a completely different set of person uh, of properties and even the attribute types so data types can be different so i don't know how why you would do that but uh, the name could in one instance be a string and another instance be uh, an integer it doesn't make a lot of sense but uh, there are, there are um instances where this actually makes sense so what we, however, do is, since we are building on top of um, Spark SQL, which is a schema strict system, we needed to enforce a certain schema. And that is uh, what we are doing by having this tables for labels approach, because we know for a given uh, node label type, we can infer a certain schema because it's already like transferred through that actual uh, table schema. And this is how it would like uh, would look like in an, if you had an example. So we have um, a, a user node um, that has also the pro account label. So it has two labels, as much said. Nodes can have an arbitrary amount of labels. Then we have in our graph a reviews relationship, and we have the business node. And as such, then we from that infer three tables. So we have the, a table that contains all the labels that have user and pro account as a label. We have a table that has all the business uh, nodes, and we have a table that has all the reviews nodes. If you now had users that are not a pro account, they would actually have to live in this different table. And then from that, we can actually infer a schema now here in a JSON-like representation. So we have uh, all the user pro account nodes. They have uh, a name as a property, and it's a string. Uh, businesses also have a name as a string, and the reviews, they don't have any properties. So. How would you do this then? Um, how would you then take your data and put them into a graph in, in Spark Cypher? There are basically two approaches. The first approach is what you already saw on the data. That's the same approach that uh, GraphX actually goes. So we actually support that way where you have only two, um, where you only have two data frames. You have one data frame for nodes and you have one data frame for relationships and then you have to do some um, uh, you have to provide us with some additional metadata. So you have to tell us for a given row in your in your notes table, for example, what actual labels does the node have? So because every row in that table represents a, a node and same for relationships. And for that, we have some column conventions. So you saw this colon person column that uh, was in the example graph that we loaded. That is a um, column name convention. So every every column that starts with a colon that is actually treated as a label property uh, as a label property column and has to be a boolean so we can infer what kind of um, labels a certain node has and then we have the more advanced approach that i showed you or that i just described where we have multiple um no where we have multiple node uh frames and multiple relationship frames that um represent the, cert the different uh, node label combinations and relationship types and what you can also do, it's not only that you can uh, define a graph from uh, existing data frames that you load somewhere in your system, we also provide the capability of storing and actually loading graphs. That capability is also just basically built on top of Spark SQL. So you can write your data um, and read your data from, from all the most of the places that Spark SQL can write to. So like m most prominently HDFS, where you can write in uh, the Parquet format or the ORC or even CSV format. However, that's not really recommended. For that, we've um, developed a very simple format using a um, well-known directory structure. So if you use this uh, store feature, basically what we're doing is we'll create a folder um, with two folders in them, one for nodes and one for relationships, and then we create a file per node label combination, and we'll also store some uh, necessary schema information in a JSON-like format and some metadata that we just need in order to read the graph in the right format again. So I'll show you now a bit how this would look like in code, how um, you could do this in a more advanced way. Uh, right. Complete, yes. So as you as you see, um, 
it starts basically exactly the same as um, we did before. We create your Spark session. All of you will basically know that. Um, and now we're doing something more more interesting here. We don't create just some uh, sample, simple data frames. We're actually reading data from CSV. Um, so we have data for our different nodes. So we basically load some movies. Uh, we load some persons from a different CSV file um, and we load some relationship data. In this case, we just load the acted in relationship um, from an even different uh, CSV file. And for now, we don't really care how they look like. I mean, we, we of course know how they look like, but also for this, we just use the standard Spark feature. So it's all the Spark SQL that you already know. And we can run this. So what we're actually doing here is now, it's also huge. Um, we'll just print the data frames to see how they look like. Um, and you'll see they, they just follow uh, this naming convention that I just mentioned. So we have some movies here. They have an ID. So that's uh, something I think we haven't uh, mentioned yet. Um, all nodes and all relationships are uh, identified by an ID. Uh, we currently... Um, support basically every type that you give us as an ID, we'll internally then transform that into basically an, a byte array, uh, th because that actually allowed us to, to take a whatever input format as an ID. But they have to be, um, uh, they have to be unique um, in a global space, basically. So all your, no all your nodes basically share an ID pool, and the same goes for relationships. So now what you see here, we have um, the movies table, for example. So it has an ID, it has some properties, um, a release date, a tagline, and a title. And then we have some uh, relationship data. Um, so here we are using those IDs to identify the source and target nodes. So we go from, in this case, from the node with, with ID uh, 23 to the node with ID 15. It also has an ID and it has some properties. And so what are we doing now with this data? Um, we can initiali initialize our Spark Cypher session. The Spark Cypher session is uh, basically the same as the Spark SQL session or the Spark session. It's just the entry point that you can use in order to interact with the graph component of Apache Spark. And then we are creating our node, da uh, our node data sets. So basically for every node label combination in our graph, as I said, we have to build this node data set. Um, we, we use a builder pattern here. We wrap the node data frame that we just loaded, the movies data. In that case, we specify what is the ID column. There's also, I think in this case, there's also an, a convention, so you can skip that. Um, if the column is called ID, you don't have to provide that information. Then we provide a label set because we need to know which actually are the, the labels that all the uh, nodes stored in this data frame have. In this case, it's only movie, but it's an array, so you can specify um, as many as you like. However, you cannot specify two data sets that have the exact same um, combination of labels. So if you have that, you have to combine them previously, uh, like as a pre-processing step. And then we uh, can specify property mapping. So here we say every uh, node in this table has a property called title, and we um, have the ability to basically remap this to another name if we so wish. In this case, we just do an identity mapping. What we can see here is actually we are not using every property available. I think um, we could see here that uh, actually our movie data set had also a release date and a tagline. But we don't need this for a use case, so we'll just ignore it and um, basically this data will then be pruned and not be available uh, inside of your graph. Uh, so And then we do the same thing for persons and um, for relationships it looks pretty similar. So we again wrap our relationship data frame. We tell the system what is the ID column, then we need to tell it what is the source and the target column. So we need to know from where to where does this relationship actually point to, and also which is the relationship type that we are um, uh, projecting here in this case. And then we just build those relationship frames, and we take those relationship frames and put them into the uh, cipher session .create graph call, which will then produce a property graph. It will automatically infer the schema for you and provide you with a property graph. So we have here a, a variable called graph, and it's of type property graph. So now what can you do with the property graph? There's, there are certain things. For example, you can show the schema. 
that I just said it's is automatically inferred. Um, let's see if that works. It did, yes. So we now see the graph contains uh, nodes with the following labels, person and movie. That's about correct. Um, we can also uh, retrieve uh, just a node data set. So basically, that's just the data that we just passed in. That's pretty simple. Um, and what we also can do is uh, we can run cipher queries. Um, that's what uh, Mats already showed. So again, we have a cipher query. Uh, we have some parameters. We will go into uh, the detail about the syntax a little later. Here you can pass in a parameter. You can uh, run the cipher query, and then you get a result object. Currently, the result object is really simple. It's uh, it just contains a single call, which is the to dataset call, which just gives you the dataset of the result. So since Cypher always returns, at least in this implementation, always returns a table as a result, um, this table then we can obviously again represent as a simple data frame. And you can access this data frame using the .ds call. In the future, there might be other possibilities. We'll show at the end of this uh, presentation, we show some advanced features where you can not only um, retrieve uh, a tabular result, but also a graph. And that's why we need a more sophisticated interface here so we can provide some more methods. Um, yes. Yeah, there we go. So that actually um, executed the cipher query here. Um, we just returned uh, the movie title. And no, actually, that did not. That's, I think, the next thing here. So we returned an actor name and the movie title. It ran the cipher query pretty straightforward. Um, and what we can then do afterwards is we can load the, uh, we can save the graph. So again, this is a very um, a, a pattern that should be well known to all of you who have used uh, data frames previously. So we take the graph, we say dot write, we can specify a mode. In this case, we just overwrite it and we save it to a certain path. Currently, I think we uh, by default always write parquet files because that's the format that's best supported in in our for our use case. Uh, in in uh, Spark graph, at least. So we can write the graph, and then we can take the same exact same path and uh, load the imported graph again, and do further querying and or defer. Basically, we wouldn't do this in the same session, but we could do this in a deferred session, a later session, and we wouldn't have to specify all those stuff um, again in the beginning if we would, would like to do some further analysis or data wrangling. And then basically, we would stop the Spark session. Uh, that automatically stops the graph session, and just as you would normally do in a Spark graph program. And command, yes. Right. And now, Mats, uh, since we've talked a lot about Cypher right now, um, we wanted to give you a short introduction on how to use Cypher and what Cypher actually is, and that's something Mats is going to do now. No, that's right now. All right. Let's talk about Cypher. What is Cypher? You've seen a little bit of Cypher syntax already. Um, a common, uh, very popular way of phrasing Cypher is it's SQL for graphs. So it borrows a lot of what SQL already does. And it does some things differently, and it adds some new things. Mainly, it adds the pattern matches, which we mainly saw now using the uh, uh, match clause. So I'll go through a little bit. What is pattern matching then? Well, you define your query pattern, which we then call a query graph. In this case, the query graph is in this example here. You have a green node, and that is related with an outgoing relationship to a yellow node. Let's say that our data looks like this. You have some yellow nodes, some green nodes, and this two node, which is both yellow and green. What are the matches? Well, we can see that one to two is a match because one is green and two is yellow. It's both yellow and green. So that's a match. Another match is two to three because two is green. Start node needs to be green. End node needs to be yellow. So that's also a match. Three to five is not a match because three is not green. And four to five is a match. But two to four isn't because four is not yellow. So that's essentially the... Uh, the concept of pattern matching. And Cypher allows you to express this 
in the following syntax way. So the query graph that we saw on the previous slide sort of have that it looks like a, a node connected to another node. That's exactly what we want to express also in the syntax of the Cypher query. In the middle here you have the important thing, the relationship. It looks like an arrow, or we think it looks like an arrow. And then you insert here the label on top of the arrow here with these uh, square braces. And the colon reviews means that it has that type. You can omit that to match any relationship of any type. Or you can use a disjunction of different types to allow any type of those specified. And on the sides here, you have the nodes. They look like circles. And inside the circles, you can pose inline predicates. Here we have label predicates with the colon syntax. And using the curly braces, you can specify uh, colon separated uh, key value pairs, pairs for the property predicates. If you want more advanced and simple equality predicates, those then go into another class because you need a little, little bit more space than is possible within this pattern syntax. But as you see, the idea here is to allow the syntax to match what's actually happening in a graphy way. The basic query structure, you'll recall a lot if you've worked with SQL, uh, a difference is that instead of selecting what you want to return at the front, you return what you want to return at the end. That's what the return clause is for. So typically, you start with some form of pattern matching. Then you have some predicates for your pattern match. Maybe you only want nodes with uh, an age property greater than 18. Or maybe you want names that start with foo. I don't know what you want to do. But you can then. Do that with a match where you can do some projections, aggregations, all that stuff that you want to do with your query language, and eventually you return, and you return a table, just like in SQL. You can order by skip limits, etc. So this is another query where we've employed use of the where clause. So you could have said uh, the curly braces here inside the node pattern for name colon Alice, but you can equally semantically uh, identically do it in the where class with an equal sign or another operator, another predicate. And you can bind things using the variables. You put some variable name in front of the colon or even with if there wouldn't be a colon there, you could, the first thing is the variable name in the, in the pattern construct. And then you use that variable to do referencing. So here we do b.name in the return class to get the name property of the business node. In comparison to SQL, like SQL for graphs, why invent SQL for graphs? Why not just use SQL? I hope this slide can give one argument for why not. This is an imaginary uh, data set where you have users and businesses, and they relate to one another. Maybe you want to see which users that both reviewed the same business. This is a way to express that in Cypher. You just say, well, a user reviewed this business. Oh, another user also reviewed this business. Now I can get, and I know that this user is a user I'm interested in. Who else? Maybe it's me, right? Who else have you reviewed the places that I reviewed? And then I want to find how many times did somebody review the same places that I reviewed? Maybe that's a fraud or, or misuse sort of review of a review platform case. Maybe you want to find people who group up and review the same places with exactly the same kind of reviews. Maybe you don't want to have that in your data set. So here we do all return the name and we count how many times this is an aggregator. So we count how many times uh, the same two people review the same place. And this is sort of how you would have to express it in SQL. Uh, it's much longer, so it's worse, right? Um, anyway, another difference is the group by class that you can see here, it's explicit in SQL, it's implicit in Cypher. So whenever you do an aggregating thing here in the projection, which count is, it's aggregating, then the rest of the non-aggregating projections classes become your grouping key implicitly. That's a very deep detail, but you'll find out once you start using Cypher exactly how it works. 
Another thing that's easy to express is variable length patterns. It's a very powerful construct in Cypher. You can say, well, I want a user who relates to another user via two to six hops, which is what this query says, or an unlimited number of times. I just want to find uh, how long do I have to go between this user and the next one. Right, so some aggregations, projections, expressions, all that stuff. And we'll talk more about it uh, in the next session. Because we have another 40 minutes after a break. Are we breaking now? Or do um, we have a few minutes yes. for questions? Maybe let's do a few Q&A if we have time, yes. Cool. Yes? Hi, can you hear me? Is there a way to have Cypher return a subgraph, uh, or is the table able to be converted into a graph? And secondly, uh, in your example you showed, I think there were three, maybe four joins in the SQL. Is Cypher doing that many joins as well, or is it optimized in some way? Uh, so there are some optimizations they're trying to employ. Uh, to answer the second question first. Um, that are, however, not yet in the uh, Spark graph feature. Uh, so we, as we said, we have been working on uh, Caps or Morpheus for over two years, and um, we'll go into detail about this uh, in, at the very end of the second session. There is some optimizations that we can do, um, but we wanted to keep the scope that we want to bring into Spark Graph very limited because it's a very tedious and long-running process, so we wanted to co keep the code minimal, so it's not there yet. Um, to answer your first question, same answer. Well, actually, on the, on the first question, you can also add the detail that in Morpheus, which uh, has extended capabilities about what Spark Cypher, so we, we kept the scope minimal, but Morpheus already has the features that allow you to return a graph, that allow you to chain graph queries. So you have a graph query that turns a graph, you know, another graph query turns a graph, maybe you return a table, use that table into SQL, and then maybe go back into a graph, sort of in a pipelining, pipelining model. This is outside of the scope for Spark 3.0. Uh, we've been using Neo4j in the past for a few customers of ours to build like a global graph of enterprise data to be able to, to query and, and get insights into a lot of different data from the company. But these graphs tend to evolve a lot. So like a person can become a customer at each time, so you add labels all the time and, and stuff like that. If here you say every time you get a new label, you have to be like in another... Uh, Table bill in other data frame, basically, in other parquet file. Uh, aren't you then going be continuously rewriting all your parquet files when you're if you if you build like a long term graph instead of just in place to do to do to do some query on? That is that's actually correct. And uh, currently, so the graphs currently are uh, they're read only. So it, we we do not in, in the cipher uh, in all the cipher queries that we currently support, we do not support any uh, update operations. Um, however, as Matt's already hinted to, in Morpheus, there is a way to create a new graph that, um, so you can, you can start with a Cypher query and then you can create a new graph inside of the Cypher query, return that graph, get a reference to that graph, and then you could write that to, to an existing file or to a new file. However, as we already said, this is not, unfortunately, not, not in the scope of Spark 3.0 currently. That feature might come in the future, near future, midterm future, we don't so, know yet. So the, main so the main use case is mainly you build it in on the spot on for the a spot. certain so for a certain query exactly yeah. okay. and if you, if your data changes if your input data changes you unfortunately currently have to like slightly adopt the, the importing process that is correct okay, okay thank you uh, we will go uh, in the in the very end of the second half we'll go into bit into detail there was another talk yesterday unfortunately the order is a bit unfortunate that explains all of the features that Morpheus has so if you're mm -hmm. interested in that you can probably look at the recording or you have been at that talk um, yeah. All right, thank you. So please make a round of applause for Max and Matt. So we're back in it. Uh, this is the continuation of the graph features in Spark 3.0 session for anyone who's new here now. So what did we do in the last 40 minutes? We covered property graphs. It's a growing data model. Spark Graph. It's a new module that will bring property graphs into Apache Spark. Cypher, it's a property graph query language based around pattern matching. That's sort of what we went over. And now that you know Cypher, or you're getting acquainted with Cypher, 
Here's another Cypher query. Essentially, it means you define a property graph somehow. Max has shown some demos on how to do that. And then you'd go Cypher. Dot Cypher, you type in your Cypher query. So what happens there, Max? Right. Um, now we're going to be a bit more technical. Um, we're uh, going to explain a bit on how do we actually execute a Cypher query on Spark C because that's basically the, m the most in-depth part, that um, the most complex part that this system will bring into uh, Cypher, uh, to into Spark. Um, and the question is, we start out with a normal string. So it, to the computer, this is just a, a string. Could be anything, could be a poem, could be a Cypher query. We don't know. So we need to somehow transform this string into a machine-readable representation that then can be later executed uh, on the Spark cluster. And we're doing this using our query procession engine. Our query processing engine is actually called Okapi. Um, and this helps us to basically take the string, transform it, and then eventually uh, execute it on the Spark cluster. Um, and how does that work? The first component that we have is the OpenCypher frontend. This is actually a component that we are sharing with the Neo4j database. It is a piece of software that makes the very first step and actually makes the query uh, uh, machine readable. It, makes it allows the computer to understand that query. So it takes that string and transforms it into a thing that we call an abstract syntax tree, which is basically a representation of the query as it is, just a set of a, a tree, a set of classes that basically represent the query in a more or less one-on-one -on -one mapping. Um, it also already does some basic optimizations and mostly canonicalization. So you can think of a query and you can think of another query and they look more or less different, but they express the exact same thing. And so what we are trying is we are trying to only have one of those representations so we don't have to take care of every possible way um, how to interpret that, that query. Uh, so we do some canonicalization, we do some normalization, and also some early rewriting to optimize the query. Also, what this thing does is it does the semantic tracking. So it both on the syntactically, on the syntactical and semantical level checks that this query is valid. So from a syntactical um, point of view, this is do I maybe have forgotten to write a certain closing parenthesis, for example, or do I, am I trying to um, use a clause that doesn't even exist? And from a semantical level, that means that we check that the user is not trying to use a variable that he has never declared before, something like that. So that's taken care of by the Cypher frontend. And what we went end up is with an abstract, uh, abstract representation of the query that is actually machine readable. Then we have the Okapi and Spark uh, Cypher pipeline. Um, Okapi, again, is also a open source um, component that we have developed during our work on both Morpheus and now Spark Graph. It is basically uh, a library that allows you to take this abstract syntax tree, or it's, it's integrating with the Cypher front, and it uh, basically allows you to take a, uh, a Cypher query and then implement as a um, Cypher engine on whatever relational system you have. And it again does a certain set of transformations uh, most notably here is that we are doing the schema typing. So the OpenCypher frontend doesn't know a lot about the schema of the graph. As I mentioned earlier, Neo4j doesn't have a lot of schema information because it doesn't enforce a lot of schema. So while um, in this case, for example, um, the parser might know that this is a string because it's, it's obviously a string, but it has no idea that u.name actually is also a string. It could be anything. It could be a Boolean, could be a string, could be an integer. The front end doesn't know, but since we have the schema, since we can infer the schema from the data frames, we have a lot more information about the graph, so we can actually tell that this is a string, and this is a string, so this comparison actually makes sense. And will uh, potentially return true results, because if, if this would be an integer, we would know this will never return true, so we can basically answer the query without having ever processed anything. Um, and then, uh, in the very end, we use uh, Spark Cypher and uh, Spark Graph to actually turn whatever Okapi produces into a series of data frame transformation, uh, data frame operations. So basically, what we are using internally is just a normal data frame API that many of you probably have used um, when you're not using uh, wide array SQL queries. 
um, with some advanced features and mappings. And once that is done, um, it's actually really only Spark SQL that takes over. So we have Catalyst that does some further optimizations um, and uh, does actually plan the query to be executed then later uh, through Spark Core on the Spark cluster. Um, so let's look at this a slightly different way. We have a query. It's a string, as I said. And that's basically the logical view of the query. And then we have a physical view of the query in the end, which is just a series of chained operators. So we always start, or mostly start, with a set of uh, table scans. A table scan is basically just load a certain table. Maybe do some filtering already. And then we have some operators that we have those uh, basically unary operators that take a table and intermediate result. Our intermediate results, they are also always tables because we are working with Spark SQL. Oops. Um, so we have um, those scans. We have our, our unary operators that are just transforming a certain table. That might be a filter, might be a selection, a projection. Then we have the join operators that join two intermediate results together. And in the end, we end up with our result, which is also just a table. Um, so what happens inside of a copy and Spark Cypher? Um, again, this is a series of transformations. Um, and the very first transformation that we are doing here is we are transforming the AST that we get from uh, the Open Cypher front end into another AST, <laughs> um, which we call the immediate intermediate language. It's just basically transforming an outside representation into our internal representation. So we convert some of the expressions. So we have an expression like plus, so that we get from the open cipher front, and then we need to transform it into our representation of plus. It's um, the, the result of that is still looks fairly similar to what the query initially looked like. Um, and also, that's actually where the uh, typing happens, so where we actually use the schema, the, m the improved schema information that we have to uh, to attach that to the nodes and the abstract syntax tree. As a next step, we do the logical planning. Again, up until the intermediate level, the query is basically just a machine re representation of what the user wrote. Um, you could trace that back. You could trace the operators there back to the actual clauses in the um, in the query string. But now we are turning this into something that is more of a instruction to the computer. And that is in our case, the first step is in our case, the logical plan. The logical plan still consists of very graphy operators. So in this case, we are thinking more in the in a graphy perspective. So we have operators like a an expand operator, that's maybe the most prominent operator there at all, which is um, an expand operator always tells us, okay, we have a certain node in our intermediate result, and now we want to expand that node along a certain type of edges into another node. So this is an, inter an inherently graphy operator. Um, and also at that step, we also do some uh, simple, basic logical optimizations, like we can do some filter pushdown. So let's say I have, uh, I have a query where I have a rare predicate, but actually I could already evaluate this rare, rare predicate when I'm scanning my nodes, so I don't have to even load all the nodes and then s manually scan through them and select only nodes I want. Maybe my backend allows me to actually only already retrieve those nodes that are um, valid under this filter constraint. And then, um, after logic planning, we have the relational planning. As I said previously, we are um, building upon the relational backend in Spark SQL in our case. So we have to now transform those more graphy operators in actual relational operators. Now, relational operators are basically those operators that you all know from your SQL queries. That's like join, select, filter, all these things. But most prominently, again, it's the join operator. Um, so we take the more graphy representation of our query and transform it into basically what could be seen as a SQL query or a, a more a more formal representation of a SQL query. Um, and here we have to overcome certain challenges. Uh, suddenly a node can't be seen as a node anymore because a node is a complex object. A node has multiple fields, if you so want. In a table, we only have columns. And in an intermediate result where we store already multiple nodes, we only have multiple columns. And we somehow have to basically fit those nodes into a certain subset of the columns. So that's one 
technical challenge we have to overcome there and um, that's what mostly happens in the relational planning. And then we end up with a series of relational operators. They are still from our system. They are basically the Okapi relational operators and then we have to transform them into the Spark Cypher or Spark SQL relational operators and that's what Spark Cypher actually does. So it takes those Okapi operators and transforms them into data set operations. Right, so we can look at this in, a, in an example. We have a very simple query, We've seen that before. So we have users, um, we want to find all users um, and their reviews of businesses. We have a filter predicate where we say, okay, our user should be named Alice. And then we want to return both the user's name and the business's name. So this is again, this is the query representation. And then we parse that query using the OpenCypher front end into an abstract syntax tree. So you can see this is really basically just a representation of the query string in a set of classes, machine readable classes. So we have the pattern representation. So this is, this is basically, this says this is a pattern. Then we have node definitions, we have a variable, um, we have another variable, u and b, and then we have relationship with no variable, but we internally we assign it a variable, we just call it unnamed 18. And then we combine this into a pattern. And as you see here, here there's no mention of this um, of this label predicate any longer because this has actually moved into a predicate. Um, and then we have the other representation of the other predicate and our return clause. So this is really closely aligned with what the initial query string was. We do then uh, the first step, we turn it into the immediate uh, intermediate language. Um, if we recall, the most prominent thing here was actually the typing. So suddenly, here there was no information about any type whatsoever. Um, if you look here, we have a reference to u.name, and there's no type information available. That's actually really a string representation of all the information that is available at this point in time, and there's no, there's no um, type information available. But suddenly, we do have this type information. Um, also, the tree is turned upside down, but that doesn't really matter right now. Um, but now we have information. We now know that u.name is actually a string. And the same goes for b.name. And right, but still the predicates, they are still um, uh, predicates uh, and not basically in the, they're not in the scans. And then we do the logic planning where we transform this um, abstract, uh, other form of an abstract syntax tree into a more machine or more executable thing that is still very graph focused. So suddenly we have operators here. So we have a node scan operator. That is not nothing that, that the user would want to write in a query. So basically the user writes, I want all the nodes of, cer of a certain type, but we have now a node scan operator here. We have this expand operator that I was talking about. So we get basically, we, we, have, a, we have this expand that goes from a node that lives in variable u over a relationship to another node that lives in variable b. We still have the filters um, for the uh, uh, node types. We have the filters for our property and we have our return types. Um, now we can do some optimizations. As I said, we can do this uh, predicate push down. In that case, we push down the filters because since we have this tables for labels format, if we just want to scan for a single relationship type, we know that we only have to scan a single data frame, basically. We don't have to look at all the other node data frames because we know they won't have any result that we are interested in. So we basically push down those, um, those predicates. And now we have a node scan that actually only scans for user nodes and business nodes. Then we do um, the relational planning. And here, the most prominent thing here is again, the expand operator has gone and has been replaced with two joins. So an expand, as we saw in a very early slide, can be expressed pretty simply as two joins. You start from your node table, you join with your relationship table, and again, you join with your uh, target node table. And that's what we are basically doing here. We have two joins now. We have a relationship scan, that's just a detail of our system. So we basically need three tables now. We need our source table, we need our relationship table, and we need our target table. All the rest still is basically the same, except that we don't call it return anymore, we call it select. Because that's what a SQL query usually calls it. So I already mentioned that one problem, or the main problem that maybe we have to overcome here, except for 
some translations of, of graphy operators into relational operators is the mapping of mapping or the, the, the process of mapping a complex object object like a node or a relationship is into a series of columns in a table. And in order to overcome that problem that we invented something that we call the record header. The record header basically describes the layout of an intermediate result, which is a table as I said earlier. So basically it describes how do we map our query variables into the intermediate results. And um, the most complex operation here is how do we map use, uh, nodes and relationships into that tab tabular format. Also, the record header basically supports certain of those SQLish uh, relational operators, so we can join two record headers and we get a new record header. That's just to make our life a little easier. Um, and here's an example. So we start out with a node scan. We scan for a user node or for all user nodes and we assign it to the variable n. And this operator would produce a table with all the user nodes and all its um, properties. In our case, the user just has a property name. So what we would end up is we would end up with an intermediate result that has the following layout. Um, we would have the actual ID of the user, that's the identity. Then we would have some information about its labels. In our case, we all know that all of those, um, all of those nodes would have uh, a true column for the uh, user label. And then we have a property column that stores the actual name property. It's not really interesting at this place. It gets a bit more interesting when we do some things like projection, because actually the property, uh, the, the record header helps helps us to to avoid certain operations. Now, if we rename the n variable into a b, so let's say in our query it's possible in Cypher using the with statement you can rename a variable, basically as the alias statement in SQL. What we are not having to do is we don't have to basically duplicate the data because we know it's just an alias that we have introduced and so our record header is capable of aliasing. So we still have the information that n um, is, an, is an variable that is available in our system, but also now b is available as in our system. Both point to the same data, that's why both um, n and b point to the same set of columns. So the node ID of n points to a column called n, and so does the node ID of b. And same goes for all the rest. Now we could remove that, we could also project the relationship, um, basically the same thing. So we have now a real name, we don't call it b.name any longer, we want to really call it just name in our query, also just an alias. So what we do is we introduce a new variable, so far it's only been just a property reference of a node, but now it's a, a variable that the user can reference, and we just point to the same column as before. And now we just want to select the two variables, b and name, and so we can prune the record header a bit. So basically, all those operations have done no actual SQL, uh, no actual operation on the data. It's just been um, renaming of columns, and we didn't have to like duplicate any data. We didn't have to touch the data at all. That's what the record header allows us. So, how does this representation look like internally? Um, what we have in Okapi and Okapi Relational is this relational table abstraction. Um, we've been developing Okapi. Uh, with the thought that it would allow other users to basically just take their um, take their relational system and implement a Cypher engine on top of it. Um, and we've done so with Spark SQL. We have a colleague who, uh, as his master thesis, has implemented the same thing on Apache Flink. Um, and that was fairly easy because we have this table representation. So we have an interface that defines how does, from our perspective, a table look like. And there are certain constraints, so it has a header and all the rest of operators that you might uh, recognize from the um, data frame API, basically. So we have a select operator, we have a join operator, a union operator, all these things, and some uh, auxiliary operators as well. And now we can implement this uh, interface basically very easily for data frames. So here we just we have a, a thing that we call data frame table, which basically just wraps the data frame. Um, and now we can implement those operators fairly easily. So if you want to implement a filter, we get an expression. These are the expressions from our system. We need to convert them. That's a pretty straightforward thing. So we need them we need basically to call, uh, convert them into column expressions. And then we can just call that df.filter. So that's the normal filter call that all of you probably have used on the data frame before. So that's a very, very straightforward mapping. 
And the same goes for joints. There's, there's no real obstacle here to overcome. Right. So this is how the system internally would now um, execute a cipher query. So it's a straight, f sometimes straightforward, sometimes not at all straightforward mapping from a cipher query to a SQL query, if you so want, which is then executed using the Spark um, data frame API. There are some ideas that we have what we could improve in the future. Um, Spark SQL currently doesn't ex uh, support common table expressions. So that is basically the uh, functionality to recursively yeah, recursively uh, execute a SQL query, which prevents us from actually supporting unbounded variable, ver variable length patterns. Um, so as Mats showed before, we have this thing where we in the relationship can use a star to say traverse this edge multiple times. Um, and currently we have to always give an upper bound because we have to basically roll that thing up and say, okay, we do one, one join and then another and then another and then another up to a certain point because we have no way in Spark SQL to actually execute a query until a certain condition uh, is satisfied. And if we had common table expressions, we could actually implement unbounded while length fixed bound. Internally, we would like to um, improve the join performance a bit uh, matching to our use case, there's some research going on um, uh, and that has shown that worst case optimal joins could help us there. Um, and then we don't have currently any graph array optimizations both in Catalyst um, and in the way Spark partitions the data. So those are certain areas where we could improve the performance of our system. Right, and Mats is going to now show you some more advanced spy Spark Cypher examples, especially how you could use uh, Cypher to analyze your data. Right. So then I'll open the advanced demo. Oh, I need to stop the other thing. Uh, no, it stopped. It is stopped. That's fine. <laughs> right. So we've seen some very simple uh, Cypher uh, this far. Let me just start this up. <laughs> Uh, again, in this demo, it looks, in the beginning, kind of the same as the previous demos. You start normally in the Spark world, you start with the Spark session. Now we have some configuration for our CSV files, where we load the data from in uh, this example. Uh, you use the configuration to load some data frames. And right here, we, you get, we have like uh, a movies data model with persons that are actors or directors and they either direct or they act in movies and uh, also they know each other I think uh, the, uh, the, the persons. Um, first we need to initialize all our data frames so we get some movies data frame, person data frame and our relationship data frames here acted in or you can follow, you can produce, you can review, and you can write for movies. Now, the graphy interesting parts begin. So, we initialize our Spark Cypher session. This is our sibling to the Spark session, which allows you to not create data frames, but create property graphs. Uh, first, we need to, again, take uh, our data frames and put graph suits on them. So we need to make sure that it's not just a data frame with some stuff in it. We need to tell the system what column represents what. So that's what we do with this no data set builder API. The ID column lives in a column called ID. So here it's kind of straightforward, but maybe you have columns that have wildly different names in your data set. We don't know. So you're allowed to specify whatever column in your data frame represents the ID value. And it has to be unique, of course. Then you say, OK, so the nodes in this data frame, what sort of entities do they represent? Like Max showed in the previous session, you say, well, there are movie nodes here. And these are person nodes. And they have these properties. Similarly for relationships, where's the ID? Where's the source ID? Where's the target ID? What type does this relationship have? And what properties does it have? And then we build it. And then we do that for all of our relationships here. We have multiple relationship types. Eventually, we can create a graph. That's what we want to arrive at. So we have our graph. We create it. 
feeding it the movie nodes, the person nodes, and all the relationships, which are of six different types here. And then we tell it to print the, its schema. So you saw this on one of the slides earlier. Now, just handing in those node and relationship data sets, the graph can be constructed and the schema can be inferred. Uh, so we see, just like uh, we just looked at in the code, we have person nodes, they have name, uh, uh, they have name properties, and the type, we didn't say what the type was, because we could read that from the data frame. So that is now printed as part of the schema. Similarly for relationships, we have these six types, and this one actually has a little bit more of a complex uh, property. It's a list of strings, not just a single scalar value. So what happens next? Here's another query. This looks a little bit more advanced than the queries we've shown so far. Here we're looking for persons who reviewed movies where the um, where we're doing an aggregation inside here. So we're taking the rating of the review. We're taking the average value of all of the ratings of all of the reviews between that anyone has made. Look, there's no predicate on what the person is, who it is, no name predicate or anything. There's also no predicate on the movie. But we're putting the title here so that we want, uh, we, because we want the average rating for some title. And then we're saying, only distinct values here. So we want, for every title, what was the average rating? And if I press enter here, it's going to compute that. So we see here that the best rated movies in our little data set apparently were Cloud Atlas and Jerry Maguire. So that's one way of uh, using Cypher a little bit with slightly more advanced syntax. We can continue on, and this query we're looking for people who acted in movies where they had more than one role in that movie. And then we want to find uh, the name of the actor, the title of the movie, and uh, the roles that they had, or in order of amount of roles. So we'll find people, uh, if did I press enter? No, I didn't. Um, we'll find people at the top of the result that had the most roles in, uh, in some movie. It's not responding. Oh, there we go. So here we see that, oh, Tom Hanks had, what, one, two, three, four, five, six roles in the Polar Express, and Hugo Weaving had also six roles in Cloud Atlas. So that's another query that's kind of easy to explain just for us, so Cypher, and you can express that query. Later on then, we also, oh, it's already ran now. So we're looking here, again, a very different query. Here we're utilizing what Max just mentioned here, the variable length pattern. So we're looking for a specific person, in this case, Kevin Bacon, and we're looking for, oh, what other nodes relate in either direction. As you notice, there's no arrow on this relationship pattern. This means that uh, it can traverse relationships that go either inbound or outgoing and uh, to some other node that we put in the variable Hollywood, and we allow the relationship, the, the, the amount of relationship traversed to be between one and three. And then we just return all the distinct matches that we got, because you can arrive, of course, at the same node with one hop as you can with three hops by jumping back and forth through your graph, for example, or jumping across different relationships arriving at the same node. And we only want unique nodes here. So we found some results, some other act actors, a few movies that were that far away from this Kevin Bacon node. And that concludes this example. And then finally, do you want to take this one? Right. So uh, we have one final example, which we have. Sorry, the slides? Yeah, okay. Right, so Neophyte Morpheus. We've been mentioning this a little bit in this talk. This is the original project where we developed all of this functionality. It's a third-party library to Spark. Parts of it, its core, its innermost things of the Cypher processing engine, 
and the Cypher 9 query capabilities, that's what we're putting into Spark Graph. All of the rest that Morpheus offers is still in Morpheus outside of Spark. So what is that? Well, it's multiple graph features. We had a question in the break from somebody asking, well, can you return not a table, can you return a graph instead? Yes, you can with Morpheus. We've developed that. Um, you, can, you can create graphs and put them in a catalog, just like you put tables in a catalog in a SQL system. You can create views, put them in a catalog. And you can integrate this catalog and sort of draw graphs out of multiple different systems, not just uh, HDFS or, or the file system, that, uh, which is part of uh, the Spark Cypher stuff that Max showed her in the first session. You can also draw them out of Neo4j, the graph database. You can draw them out of a SQL system using a domain-specific language we call GraphDDL to define a graph type and then a mapping from some system that speaks SQL uh, to draw a graph out of that, uh, which is very useful. You can find this, it's on OpenCypher Morpheus, open source, Apache licensed. Um, check it out. Then, so what does that look like? Did, did I, um, did we have that here? No, okay, let's open it. So normally it looks very similar to the demos we just showed. You create some data frames, then you eventually create a graph, and you can run Cypher queries on the graph. In the Morpheus part, it's worth the commenting out here. Um, now you can do other stuff. You just upgrade your dependency by adding, instead of just depending on Spark, you add another dependency for Morpheus, and now you have the elevated, you have all of the same stuff that you had in your previous program will just run, plus you can get a Morpheus session here. This is what it's converted to, this is a Morpheus session. And uh, what, you can, what you can do then is you can register sources, property graph data sources, in this case uh, we again exemplify like a file system grade graph data source. This could be an E4J database, it could be a SQL system. And now you can do stuff in your Cypher query such as from graph, some graph in my catalog, I want to match. So I, just, I don't have to in code specify my graph and call Cypher on that. I can directly in my Cypher query reference the catalog, call a Cypher query on that. Switch graphing mid query, uh, match something from that graph, combine those results, construct a new graph. It's very powerful. So here, what we do is take the FS products graph, we match some nodes, and then we construct a new graph by simply copying all those nodes into the next graph. And uh, there are much more advanced capabilities that you can do here to construct new graphs and combine from different data sources. This is all in the Morpheus space. So just to uh, wrap up a little bit, the SPIP, as we mentioned, uh, the project we're working on to get this actually into Spark, uh, it's accepted in February. Right now, we have a fully proof of concept implemented uh, system. Uh, the PRs, uh, some of the module PRs have went in. The API PR is currently in review. Uh, but we are not Spark committers, so we cannot merge this code. We rely on support from the community. And please, if you know or are very interested in this stuff, uh, help us out and review and merge this and help us get, go successful with it. Maybe even contribute to documentation or a Python API that we have. Also, um, if you want to check that out, if you want to try it out before it's actually merged into Spark on GitHub, uh, in the Spark project, there is a pull request called Spark Graph POC, I think. That's um, what we've been using. It includes all the examples that we've been showing and it includes all the code that you need to, in order to run uh, Spark Graph uh, programs. We try to keep that in sync with the current or latest development that's happening, for example, currently in the um, API pull request. So if ever there are changes requested to the API pull request, we try to keep and that in sync with um, the POC. So there you can go and check it out. And if you like it, as Matt said, please help us bringing this into Spark 3.0. Um, 
Yeah. Thank you. And that's basically it. Thank you so much for your attention and for being here. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Max and Matt. A uh, couple of questions, maybe? Hello. Uh, that is actually groundbreaking. Very nice. But uh, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, specifically, in uh, graph analysis, since uh, using Spark and uh, all the Spark ecosystem, we have access to the global graph. Uh, do you also, with the Cypher and all the st uh, that stuff, provide uh, a suite of uh, global metrics such as connectivity, closeness, uh, betweenness, whether a node is leaf or not, something like a global description of the graph in order to make more, more sophisticated analysis on the graph and not just asking simplistic questions on the graph related, to, related only to your data. Thank you. Right, so um, some of the metrics there that you mentioned, uh, we, we call those graph algorithms and it is a topic that we are not uh, engaging with in the Spark Cypher work. We're starting off by introducing the proper graph model and introducing the Cypher language, which we believe is a core component, that, like the elementary least thing that you need to be able to work with a graph effectively. And on top of that sits a bunch of other graph processing capabilities with a much higher level of advanced uh, and maturity level stuff like graph algorithms. Um, we don't know exactly uh, how Spark Cipher can, or how these can build on top of Spark Cipher, but in Neo4j, of course, you can use this to connect with Neo4j, and you can run those sort of metrics on the Neo4j database. There's another Neo4j product, which we're not talking about here today, but I think Alicia had a talk on that yesterday, about graph algorithms, how to use them, and um, uh, Neo4j has products in this space that are uh, launching soon. So check that out. <laughs>